tonight I want to talk about something really close to my heart, which is ending conflict and poverty. It's something that I've spent a lot of my working career on so far. 1.5 billion of the poorest people in the world live in countries affected by conflict. They're essentially concentrated in those countries. These people live on $1.25 a day or less. And the gap is growing between those and the rest of us, whether it's health, education, income, justice, you name it. And I often imagine that the world to those people must look something like this, this increasingly visible chasm, this divide, this unjust divide between the haves and the 1.5 billion have-nots. And this is what I really care about. Enter the G7 Plus. Has anyone here heard of the G7 Plus? This is a group of 20 self-identified, conflict-affected and fragile countries who are poor countries. They often joke themselves that unlike the G20, they're the club that everyone wants to get out of. <laughs> and these are a really important group, a really important club, because they emerge to demand a new deal from the international system, a deal to end conflict and to end poverty. These leaders, these societies, can make history in the next 15 years. They can take poverty down, extreme poverty down, from 1.5 billion people now to 350 million people by 2030. Now, can you guess how they would do it? How does this new deal work? Well, it comes down to building national and subnational institutions. Now, how these institutions are built and what's most relevant to context is up to each society. And of course, we know there are many different icons of political vision and leadership. They're very diverse. There's no one model that fits all. Now, it may come as a surprise to you to find out that apparently the international community doesn't know that. And it's had to find out this the hard way. Now, let's take the example of Afghanistan, which I'm sure everybody here knows something about. Now, there are four factors that tend to affect all G7 plus fragile countries. And to take us into Afghanistan to talk about this is a farmer that grows poppy in Afghanistan. Now, he could actually make more money growing pretty much any other crop than poppy. Yet, he sells opium to warlords that ruin his country. Why on earth would he do that? Four factors. First, politics. The political institutions in Afghanistan aren't yet representative and inclusive enough that this man has any means to influence policies in his and his community's direction that would help him to change his income. Secondly, security. Right now, this man takes his life into his own hands if he tries to take goods to market to trade. The drugs trade, on the other hand, the armed thugs, will go straight to his gate to buy the opium from him. This is his only option. Third, justice. Decades of conflict and corruption decimated the country's justice institutions. After the fall of the Taliban, there was barely a judge in Afghanistan that could read and write. This man cannot possibly get a contract enforced in his favor. And the fourth point, opportunity. Not only is this man held back by the political, security, and justice challenges of the country. He's held back by his own poverty and economic conditions. And that's why it's actually perfectly rational that this man would be surviving in a war economy, because it's the only means that he has to feed himself and his family. Now, you've probably seen all of the images across the television for many years of the wasted money that flooded into Afghanistan after 2002. Here's a pile of chairs for school children that are being used as firewood because the school behind it doesn't have any teachers in it to teach. Now, the, that's the problem with the aid that went to the country. It didn't build national institutions. It didn't, uh, it didn't not support national plans. It did incentivize corruption. And most fundamentally, it didn't address all of those issues that that farmer needs to have addressed in order to really make a difference and to build legitimacy, a sense that this new Afghanistan is legitimate to us, the people of Afghanistan. And that's the fundamental message of the G7 Plus to the international community. Thank you for your aid. We do need it. 
But first, we have to resolve conflict and political crisis and build confidence among ourselves. And then we have to go about the business of building our institutions that work for us uh, and in ways uh, that it contribute towards eliminating poverty. So the G7 Plus, in framing this new deal, they came up with five common goals that they've all signed up to, to achieving. The first, let's think of our farmer again, is about legitimate politics, that citizens can influence policies in some way. Second, that they should provide security to citizens so that citizens can live their lives. Third, that everyone should have some access to justice, some safety. And fourth, opportunity. On the one hand, laying the foundations for economic growth, and on the other, starting to collect taxes so that countries can start to deliver their own basic services. And the fundamental uh, central, I suppose, pillar, you could say, of the New Deal, you know, what's the deal about this New Deal, is a compact. So the compact is between the G7 plus government, society, and the international community that everyone rallies to the cause of working towards the same common five goals, not going all off in their different directions, and they're mutually accountable to one another for progress. Now, I had the privilege of doing a review for the signatories to the New Deal, the G7 Plus and their international partners recently. Uh, so I suppose really what I want to talk about now is did the New Deal work? Has it made a difference? Was it a better deal? Well, here's what I found. of what The New Deal has made a really big difference in one very, very important way in that it's elevated the messages and the status of the G7 Plus in the world. In 2015, a new global goal was agreed for achieving peaceful and inclusive societies and institutions. Now, that's history. It's the first time that poor and conflict-affected countries in the world managed to shape global development objectives. Secondly, it's history because it's the first time that the world itself has managed to agree that inclusion, legitimacy, and institutions are central global parts of international development. So much focus in the past has been on health, education, uh, social and economic areas. And third, it's the first step in overcoming this dynamic. The West lectures the rest, finger wagging, speaking down and patronizing developing countries that's dominated so much international cooperation for so long. Inside the G7 plus countries, however, I think it would be fair to say that the New Deal isn't so new yet. So we'll talk about Somalia as an example. There have been security improvements in the country. There's a transitional government that's been tasked with building peace. And the international community and the Somali authorities signed a compact a few years ago around those goals outlined in the New Deal. And here's the handshake moment, if you like, between the former EU commissioner and the president of Somalia. And the international community has genuinely tried to align its aid behind the goals outlined in the compact. But here's the problem. Somalia society is still missing. Of course, society has to also be a part of this equation in owning and advancing what needs to happen and how in order to build peace in the country and restore trust between state and society. And Somalis really want to contribute to this. Here's uh, uh, some pop musicians in, in a concert that was about uh, ending violence and conflict in the country. Many Somalis feel regret that they didn't get to contribute to what was outlined in terms of the priorities in the compact. And there's a problem with that because we can't know for sure that what's happening under the compact is necessarily advancing legitimate politics, security, justice, and opportunity because we have no way of knowing what citizens expected from their state. They weren't asked during the formulation. And the risks of not asking citizens are high. Is the aftermath of one of the relapses into conflict of the newly formed country of South Sudan. Just before these moments, the international community and the new government of South Sudan were about to sign on to a new compact under the New Deal. But the process was deeply flawed. The international community and the South Sudanese authorities never really discussed how aid was being used in the country and whether it was or it wasn't truly advancing peace. And there was no dialogue whatsoever 
between state and society. Society was totally disenfranchised. And we see the outcome of that lack of dialogue. So how can the G7 Plus ensure in the future that they are inclusive enough to keep building peace and keep moving towards that global ambition, that historic ambition of, of uh, significantly reducing poverty in the next 15 years? Well, I think there's three key things that need to happen. The first is that the G7 Plus themselves need to galvanize action inside their countries, involving their citizens, involving their parliaments in setting priorities. And here's a Sierra Leone parliament who've actually become very involved in the New Deal recently. Secondly, decades of all this Western finger wagging means that the G7 Plus are not especially receptive to being dictated to and lectured about inclusivity by Western governments. But the G7 Plus are able to advise one another on processes and experience. This uh, is the Minister of Planning of Timor-Leste, who's also the former president and prime minister of the country. And when Central African Republic experienced a very severe crisis last year, he went to the country to share lessons uh, about Timor-Leste's experience in conflict resolution and reconciliation. I think that's a really powerful role for the G7 Plus that could be built up. And third, we, the international community, need to stop dictating timelines and processes to national actors, be they government or be they society. We need to create the space for inclusive dialogue and inclusive politics to emerge and for nationally owned and nationally, uh, nationally led institutions to take hold. If we do these things, 15 years from now, we will have truly helped to change the lives of 1.5 billion people, including improving the condition of our friend, the farmer, in Afghanistan. But doing this means we must build, help to build inclusive institutions, we must support national plans, and we must set, stand back and let local actors be in the lead. Thank you very much. <laughs>